grace and peace. It is, uh, it's wonderful to be with you all tonight and, uh, and to get to, to welcome everyone, of course, but uh, especially those who are new. And um, I say it almost every week, but boy, it takes a lot of courage sometimes to come into church, um, especially a church like ours. We have lots of folks with all the history sometimes with church and, uh, you know, some of it good. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes not so good. <laughs> so I know, um, yeah, it just, it's just meaningful to have you, you all um, with us. And uh, that, of course, includes those joining us online. We love you all lots. So we are in, oh, I think this is part two, right? Week, oh, there we go. Um, week two of uh, Advent and um, our, the series of our kind of Advent or the room uh, for Advent. And I know that this is kind of somewhat of a, a religious term, you know, Advent. This isn't a, a word we hear in like popular American culture. So uh, for those unfamiliar, the, the season of Advent, it's not the same as Christmas. It's really the, the lead into Christmas. It's a season of um, preparation, kind of preparing the heart, the mind um, for Christmas. And uh, I think a, a good metaphor for it is one of prayer. You know, when we pray, um, there is a certain, love of, a certain level of kind of faith, hope, love in that moment of prayer, and yet it's not the moment of fulfillment necessarily. You know, when you pray, you're sort of looking towards, especially when it's like those desperate prayers, you know, the, oh God, please show up prayers. That's an Advent prayer. You know, it's, the, it's like, I need you to come through. I need a breakthrough. I need a word. I need, I need you. I'm a little, maybe more than a little desperate here. That's Advent. So it's, it's a, a season of preparation. Um, so the title of my message tonight uh, in that spirit is um, just one word, wilderness. Wilderness. And uh, we have two primary scriptures tonight, um, which we'll read in a moment. Um, but both of them are about someone uh, in the Bible that doesn't necessarily get like a lot of airtime in church. Um, it's John the Baptist, who, um, contrary to some popular opinion, was not a Baptist in the modern sense. Uh, he is just as the name is John the Baptizer, um, because he really, um, he prepared the people for Christ. Um, so, and he even had to clarify at times, they were like, are you the Messiah? Are you the deliverer? Are you the one God sending? You know, and he had to clarify like, nope, I'm not the one, but I am the preparer of the way. So you can see how um, John the Baptist really figures quite prominently in Advent, right? Because it's like the season of preparation for the coming of Christ. And what is John all about, right? So you'll notice a lot of, uh, of Advent texts, um, and I'm kind of following the church calendar right now. So it, it kind of tells me what to, like what the verses are, what the passages are. So a lot of them are often in Advent. They're about John the Baptist. So we got two of them tonight. Um, the first is an Old Testament reading. Uh, it's from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, and Malachi the prophet writes, I will send my messenger, and you can see this is a, a prophecy about John. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord who you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Uh, our second text also about John is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, uh, verses 2 through 6. And this is um, really describing the mission of John. Verse 2, During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. So now he's quoting Isaiah. Um, and you might recognize this from um, very famous Martin Luther King Jr. speeches. He loved this passage. It really is quite poetic and beautiful. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. So tonight, uh, I want to focus in on verse 2 of what we just read above from Luke 3, where the Bible says, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. 
the wilderness, of course, kind of refers to, to any area. In this context, it would be primarily the desert, because right, this is happening in what we know now as kind of the, the Middle East. Um, but wilderness, of course, can be really anywhere away from civilization, right? Deep in the forest, the desert. And kind of what I, what I want to ask tonight is the question, um, why? Why the wilderness? Why, why was John in the wilderness? So we know just a little bit of background. There's a verse 80 of Luke chapter 1. Um, you know, it's a big chapter when it's verse 80. Um, we won't read the whole thing, mercifully. But uh, there's, it gives us a little bit of background, a little, little insight into this. It says, uh, and the child, this of course is John, grew and became strong in spirit, uh, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. So you'll notice it doesn't say he visited the wilderness. Um, it says he, he lived there in the wilderness. So um, why? Why was he in the wilderness? Well, that little publicly to Israel part probably indicates um, this was some sort of season of preparation for John, right? He had a public ministry, a not wilderness time to come where he'd be in the cities and preaching and, you know, spreading the word. Um, so the wilderness was about a, a kind of a season of preparation. Um, but I think, you know, in a way, I guess we could leave it there and just be like, oh, okay, well, I guess that's that. But um, I think another part of me wants to ask the question, yeah, but like, why there? Why, why does the preparation have to happen in the wilderness? Does that make sense? Like, is it does, it's, am I, I mean, is it just me or is this a little bit strange? Like, I mean, if you think of it, does a, um, I don't know, like a physician, does, does the physician, does she like head on out to the wilderness to learn all about the body, right? To prepare to be a physician or a doctor? Like, nope. Uh, does a, uh, how about a, maybe a mother? Does she like go on out to the wilderness to learn the art of mothering or the artist, the painter, to, to become a great painter? Go on out to the wilderness, you know, like, no, like we know, like people don't do this. And the reason, of course, is because it's the wilderness. There's nothing there. I, uh, I recently had a little taste of wilderness. I mentioned last week I went to, um, or our family went to New Mexico for Thanksgiving. So I got to drive through uh, West Texas. Woohoo! Oh my gosh. And of, of course, it's sort of fall, you know, kind of shading into winter. So there's not even crops right now. It's, I mean, there's just dirt. Like dirt, and then those huge windmills doing their slow, kind of somewhat creepy dance in the distance. You know, at, at night now, if you drive out through West Texas, they all have those red lights that all kind of sync up. I'm just kind of dum, dum, dum. Oh, just the whole sky, just dum. It's sort of intense, and it's like the only thing to look at because there's just nothing out there at all, right? What, what is that? Like, that's wilderness. So God, like, looks at John. is like, okay, time to head out there. You need to get ready. So you're going to go out there. It's going to be great. You know, like, what? Like, what kind of a weird call is this? Um, I think it's, it's strange because, um, like, it's, it, it's, it's weird to us because we, we, I think in our kind of modern era, like, we don't really understand um, what it would be to move apart from culture. Right? And I think th it strikes us this whole thing of wilderness in the Bible, because honestly, it's all over the Bible. If you read it, I mean, over and over and over again, when God has a call on someone's life, he often calls them to a season, sometimes years, in the wilderness. Um, I mean, you think of Moses, his wife Zipporah, wilderness. Um, Abraham and Sarah, wilderness. John the Baptist, of course, Jesus, remember his 40 days in the wilderness, right? Like, this is the theme. But again, it just strikes us as so bizarre and strange. Like, why? Why the wilderness? There's nothing out there. Um, I think this is why. 
Um, if you're a note taker, you can write this down. The wilderness is the place where we face what we fear the most. Not wild animals and harsh elements, but ourselves. See, this is why I think we misunderstand the wilderness, and it just strikes us as somewhat bizarre and strange and sort of eccentric, you know, sort of God's eccentric, and he calls people to do weird eccentric things. But, but it's because we think, well, there's nothing out there. There's nothing in the wilderness, so why would God call people to go to the wilderness to prepare for some call in their life? Like, this makes no sense. But that's what we don't understand. It's not what's, a, it's, it's not what's in the wilderness, right? Because we already know there's nothing there. That's why it's so effective and powerful. There's nothing there, right? In other words, you go to the wilderness, there is, there's no culture, there's no people, there's no voices, no opinions, no distractions, no screens, no, no, no alcohol, no drugs, no stimulants, no sedatives, no, no um, boyfriends or girlfriends or husbands or wives or friends or not even enemies that we can complain about. You know, like, there's just, there's literally, you go to the wilderness and there's just flat out nothing there. But what happens? We suddenly, in the wilderness, we have to face the very thing that in ways we've been avoiding our whole lives, ourselves our aloneness, our disappointments, our boredom, isolation. It's like there's just no props. And suddenly, who is it? It's us, and it's God. And that's it. The wilderness is the place where we face what we fear the most, ourselves. And, and this is why I think um, in the wilderness, you do one of two things. Either you break down or you break through. Like either you go to the wilderness and you get real quiet and it drives you completely crazy? Or you go to the wilderness and you discern the still, small voice of God saying, you are my beloved child. In you, I am well pleased. And I have a call on your life. And I'm calling you away from everyone because I don't want you to be like everyone else. I want you to be who I've called you to be. And I've got a message, a word, for you to live and speak to the people around you. And so I'm calling you away, away, so that I can say the thing I need to say to you, because finally when you're in the wilderness, you can actually hear. This is why we go to the wilderness. And isn't this what happened to John? Did you catch it in, in verse 2? It says, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, what happened? The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. In other words, John went out to the desert, and he got real quiet, and it was there that he discerned what on earth God was up to in his life. I love this quote from uh, Marlena Graves. She says, uh, we hear many voices and sometimes have difficulty distinguishing among gods our own, the world's, and that of devils toying with us, meaning to eat us alive. It's a little intense, but I think it's true. I think that's why we go to the wilderness. Now, uh, it's very possible you might be thinking to yourself, well, that 
all sounds very interesting, um, even inspiring, but only problem is I don't like camping. Not really much of a camper. Not really a wilderness kind of guy or gal. You know, it's just not my thing. Or maybe you're like, oh, the wilderness, that sounds great. Get me out to the wilderness pronto. However, uh, I do have a life and maybe you know, a job or children. And I, I love all this wilderness talk, but I definitely don't have time for a three-month vision quest in the desert with just me and God. <laughs> God. Um, well, here is the good news I have for you tonight. Um, maybe it's bad. I think it's good news. Here's the good news. We'll just frame it as good news. The wilderness will find you. Is that, how does that strike you? Maybe I shouldn't have pointed with my finger. Maybe if I, maybe if I said, the wilderness will find you. Maybe that'd be better? I don't know. No, I'd like the intense version. The wilderness will find you, my friend. I promise you, the, it will find you. I mean, um, I just think of it. COVID 2020, lockdown. I mean, not just the nation, like the world. What, what was that? Wilderness. Or unemployment, the kind that goes on longer than two weeks. Two weeks of unemployment, two thumbs up. Fun. Vacation, it's like, yeah. Two months, two years. Mm. Wilderness. The hell of depression. Wilderness. When the relationship ends. Wilderness. Prison. Wilderness. Rehab. Wilderness. They know. Wilderness. <laughs> They're more excited about it than we are, but... And, and what happens? I mean, when we enter into those seasons of wilderness, what happens? I think something in us just starts screaming out, like, no, no. No, I, I would scream if I could. I don't want to hurt y'all's ears, but just like, no, maybe that's like I can back away. Just no, oh wait, no, 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 no. I could see, it's like sometimes, have you ever had this experience? Like you can feel the wilderness descending upon you. You feel it in your mind, you feel it in your body. The anxiety, the fear, the oh my God, what is going on? What is the purpose of my life? Like I'm feeling alone. I'm, and it's, it's coming upon and something in us just reacts and we're like, no, and and. Basically, we say a big um, no to the wilderness. This is what I call, we have kind of two kinds of wilderness tonight. The first is the wilderness we reject, right? And this is the wilderness that we say, okay, I'm here. I'm in the, it's sort of like COVID, right? There's no like, well, I'm just not. No, you are. But, but there's a way of being in the wilderness without being in the wilderness, right? And what I mean is we run to our props. We run to our emotional coping mechanisms, we, we run to our addictions like that. The wilderness descends upon us, and we're like, no, 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 no. I need a drink. I need a drink right now. I need more than one drink right now. Right? I need a smoke. I, I need whatever. Everyone has their thing. Right? I need endless YouTube videos or chocolate or just people, just people, 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 people. like. I just, I, I, I have to keep the conversation going. If the conversation stops, then what? I'm back in the wilderness with myself and God and like nothing else. This is what we do, right? It's the wilderness we reject. And then the other kind, type B, the wilderness that we accept. This is when we say, okay. Not my will, but yours be done. Like, I'm here. I'm here. I'm listening. Put me through your refining fire, and I'll do my best to take it sober. <laughs> I'll do my best to go right through it. 
Now, is this just about pointless suffering because God just wants to put us in the wilderness? No, remember why. Remember why. I'm going to the wilderness so that I can hear your word. I'm going to the wilderness so that I can remember again my true name, so I can remember again that God calls me beloved son, beloved daughter, beloved child. I'm a child of God. I'm remembering this again, and he's solidifying that in us, right? Because you can know it up here in the head. It's got to sink down deep, and that's what happens in the wilderness. Remember, the wilderness is the place where we face what we fear the most our Ourselves. But that can only happen when we move into a season of, of accepting the wilderness. Saying, like, okay, well, I heard someone had the quote. Um, it's so simple, it sounds almost hokey, but it's just so true. Wherever you go, there you are. But this is exactly the insight we want to reject. Like, nope, don't want to be here. Mm-mm. I reject this right? And there's something powerful about saying like, okay, here I am. Wherever I go, there I am. God, you've got me in the wilderness right now. I'm receiving it. I receive it, and I trust that good things are going to come from it. I trust that I'll hear your word. I'll trust that I'll hear your voice, that you'll meet me in the midst of this. However that looks, I'm going to close with a, a story uh, of a man named Arvo Part. Probably not many of you may know Arvo. Um, he is one of the great composers um, in the world right now. And he happens to be a Christian, um, a man of just tremendous depth and soul. He, I mean, if you can ever hear him speak like on YouTube, um, just amazing. But um, he's been composing for quite some time. And in the years um, from 1968 to 1976, he went through a, this, this eight years where, I mean, he's a composer, and he was completely unable to compose anything. It was just this sort of creative drought, this, this wilderness season in his life. And in, in somewhat of kind of um, desperation, he, in 1976, towards the end, he headed out um, to a monastery in his home country of Estonia. I think, um, I think it's interesting that sometimes when people go on retreats, maybe not three-month desert vision quests, but even just weekends, you know, like there's something in us sometimes where we need the geography around us to kind of match the geography of the soul. You know, the, like the wilderness within. We need to be in a, in a space where it's like the wilderness is also outside us. And so that's what he did. He headed out to this monastery. And he was there for a long time. And one day, he was sitting in uh, the courtyard. And he had his, his pen and his notebook. And he was trying desperately to compose. I mean, as he'd been doing for eight years. <laughs> and he's just sitting there. Nothing's really coming to him. And he, suddenly, um, he heard the voice of a little girl. She was about 10 years old. She, like, walked up to him. And she said... What are you doing? What are you, what are you writing there? And he said, "Well, I'm trying to write music, but it is not going so well." <laughs> and she looked at him and she said, "Well, have you thanked God for this failure already? Have you thanked God for this failure?" already. And he said it was like the word of God to him. It just, it just hit him. Have you thanked God for this failure already? He left the monastery. That year, his wilderness season broke, and it launched him into, I mean, really almost 40 years of composing some of the most beautiful music the world has ever heard. But it started, his breakthrough came when he learned to, to not fight his wilderness, but he learned to accept it and even to thank God for it. And so as we 
come to the table of the Lord tonight. We're going to come to remember again, to connect with the one who himself took on flesh and entered the wilderness of this world. And so as we come forward, I want to I invite you to um, reflect on your own seasons of wilderness. Maybe you're in one right now. Um, maybe it's been in the past. But I want to invite you to reflect on that season and just start inching towards accepting it, inching towards thanking God for it. Because there is something so beautiful about receiving, accepting our, our own crosses our suffering, our failures, our wilderness. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Uh, so for those unfamiliar with um, communion, this is an ancient practice that goes back to, I believe it was the night that Jesus was betrayed before his crucifixion. He had one final meal with the disciples. And at one point during the meal, he stood up and he broke a loaf of bread. And he said, this is my body. Take and eat. And then he held up a cup of wine, and he said, this is my blood. Um, drink it in remembrance of me. And he said, whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink this cup, remember me, remember me. And so for 2,000 years now, Christians have come to the table of the Lord Jesus to remember again who Christ is and how he saves us, body, soul, spirit, how he brings us out of the wilderness into places of fruitfulness and flourishing. So that's what we're doing as we engage tonight. Um, we practice what's called an open table um, here, uh, which basically means everyone is welcome to the table. There's no um, theological police checking your Christian credentials as you uh, get up from your seat. Um, having said that, of course, there's no pressure. Um, if you would rather not participate, that's perfectly fine. Um, too. So instructions for how to take communion are going to be on the screen. Um, it'll be pretty straightforward. Um, Raymond will serve you some bread. He has tongs because the entire city of Wiley was out of food service gloves that I looked for for an hour. <laughs> so tongs it is. <laughs> Hopefully it's not offensive to anyone. Um, and then uh, our Vicky will um, be serving you the, the cup. Of course, you can just pick it up on your own, but She'll um, have some words for you. So um, let me invite you to the table um, with these words. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. And it is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often, and you who have not been here long. You who have tried to follow, and you who have failed. Come, because it's the Lord who invites you, and it is his will that those who want to meet him should meet him here. Come to the table.